Hello, and welcome to Building High Performance Cultures, a weekly series where we talk to executives from top organizations and leaders about how we build high performance cultures and how they're levering, leveraging culture as competitive advantage. I'm Marty Parker, President and CEO of Waterstone Human Capital. And today we're talking about superhuman leadership and the power of rest, refocus, and recharge. And with me today is the founder and CEO of Wells Performance, Dr. Greg Wells. Welcome, Greg. Marty, good to see you. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm delighted to have you on the show, especially as the first guest. So let's see how this goes. Right on. A little bit of background. For those of you who don't know Greg, um, Greg's a scientist, he's a physiologist, and he's dedicated his career to making the science of human limits understandable and actionable. And for over 25 years, Greg has worked with some of the most high performance individuals on the planet, which includes Olympic and world champions and athletes, some of the top performing leaders in organizations and the organizations themselves. And Wells Performance is a global consulting firm that's really dedicated to helping teams, schools, businesses, and of course leaders become places or people where they get healthy, perform optimally, and reach their potential. Um, and I can say that uh, as a, uh, a client and a friend of yours, Greg, I've certainly benefited from those on a monthly basis and oftentimes more uh, with the work that we do together. So I'm just delighted to have you uh, here joining me for our first ever episode of Building High Performance Cultures. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm super psyched to be here and uh, love what you do. So happy to support this and really looking forward to our, our conversation. Continuing on the journey, and uh, it's just kind of the next level of it. So, Greg, maybe if you don't mind, tell us a little bit of your story, how you, how this all came to be, how you got into this very unique and high-impact business. Sure, sir. Uh, so, yeah, the origin story is goes quite a ways back. Uh, Fifteen years old on the Canadian youth uh, swim team, and we were down in Florida at a training camp with my club team, and uh, got picked up by a wave uh, in the ocean. We were out body surfing, dropped on my head, broke my neck. And uh, that led to, you know, being immobilized in, in traction for three months and then out of that into neurosurgery and then a year of recovery and regeneration. I was able to get back into swimming again, actually was able to compete at uh, Olympic trials 14 months after breaking my neck, although I didn't make the team. I was there. That's pretty cool. Went on to swim all the way through university and that sparked my interest in kinesiology and the human body. So I took that at college, got out, started a consulting practice right away out of university, did that for a few years, rapidly hit a ceiling for what I was able to do with a, with a kinesiology degree, went back, did a master's PhD and um, consulted with the Canadian Olympic team throughout that time, built up my ex expertise in working with Olympic athletes as a, as a physiologist. Uh, that led to some research opportunities at SickKids Hospital in Toronto around exercise medicine. I did some biomedical engineering at Toronto General and then commentated the Olympics for 2010 and 2012 for Canadian TV. Uh, that led to public speaking, that led to books, that led to consulting opportunities, that led me to CEO coaching, and here we are today. Um, so what is that? That's a, that's a 33 year journey in about 30 seconds. So that's, that's, the, that's the origin story. Yeah, and that's uh, kind of also indicative of your being a high performance person yourself. Yeah, that's but, uh, right. We're going to talk uh, a little bit about, I mean, you've, you've written four books now, the most re recent being The Ripple Effect and the newest book, which I have right here. And a nice. couple of weeks ago, I was the first, you know, those of us at Waterstone were the first people to get this. So we're, yep. we're happy. And that's Rest, Refocus, Recharge, which is subtitled The Guide for Optimizing Your Life. And of course, a lot of our audience are leaders and executives out there. Um, and this is a fascinating book. I've had the, the pleasure to read it uh, and now go through it and read it a second time. So I wanted to start with kind of some of the, the chapter titles are really interesting here. And having read the book, I thought they were a great way to take us through kind of some of the highlights. But maybe give us a little background into the book, Greg, and then we'll, we'll jump into some of the kind of, I think, more salient points. Sure. So The Ripple Effect came out a few years ago, and that was a book that I wrote. Uh, so Super Bodies was my first book, and I wrote that after the 2012 Olympics, and that was all about the science of human performance. And it was sort of a peek behind the curtain at what Olympic athletes do to get ready to compete. That one did just fine. It was great. Um, but the questions begin from people, which is, okay, that's great. That's what Olympians do, but what can I do? I'm not going to the Olympics. I might be just driving my kids to hockey practice, or I'm just trying to get to work, uh, just trying to survive to the next vacation. So and in my speaking, I was noticing that people were very interested in things like sleep and nutrition and exercise and 
recovery, regeneration. So the, the second book was The Ripple Effect, and that dealt with how to sleep soundly, how to to eat smarter, how to move more, and how to think clearly. That was a counter to the grand epidemics of sleeplessness, obesity, physical inactivity, and mental health challenges. Uh, and then over the last few years, since the ripple effect came out, and the ripple effect was a, a runaway success around the world, which is you know, just so cool. But the question became so often from people was like, I, I love all of this stuff, it's great, but I don't even have time to tie my own shoes, much less meditate for 20 minutes. And so, this book was really uh, sparked by the idea of how do we do little tiny things every single day that can move the needle towards getting healthier in an environment where everybody's stressed, everyone's, so many people are facing burnout, there's depression, there's anxiety. And so in a background of an environment where everyone's so stressed, so tired, so fatigued, so burned out, how do we even begin to make this move? So I look at things like what's the effect of having or taking three deep relaxing breaths you know, even just right now, taking a breath, my shoulders uh, just relax a little bit. I sit up a little bit straighter, my facial muscles relax. And so if we drop in these little moments of recovery and regeneration into our lives, they can have exponential benefits. And so that was the idea behind the book, just making it really easy for people to do things, incorporate them into their lives that have exponential impact so that we can all get on a better trajectory towards getting healthier and reaching our potential, whatever it is that we care about the most. So, so much about this book, and it really starts this way, is about recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, although there are, there are optimization techniques and, uh, you know, virtually the entire book is rooted out of science. You are a scientist, uh, nonetheless. I guess I am too, but in social sciences, mm -hmm. you know, you talk a lot about recovering deliberately. Take us through that and what you think kind of the key attributes are of deliberate recovery. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. And as a physiologist for the Olympic team, that was my primary job. It was like, how do I help people get from one event to the next or from one day to the next or get through this training camp or rest up for the Olympics? And so recovery was one of my primary jobs for many, many years with the Olympic team. And it was interesting to watch with athletes in the 80s and 90s, the philosophy was just train as hard as you can. The mo Whoever does the highest volume wins. You remember that from being an athlete when, when you were in college and uh, you know, we literally, whoever didn't get injured were the people that made, made the Olympic team or made the national team or made the varsity team or whatever it happened to be. And that has totally changed. Whereas now the focus in high performance sports, probably best personified by Kawhi Leonard last year with the Toronto Raptors really revolves around load management, making sure that you're training at the highest level, you're managing your physiology and your health to, to not get injured. You're getting enough rest. So that when the playoffs come around, you're able to elevate your performance to a new level uh, athletes are no longer peaking once a year at world championships and once every four years at the Olympics they are peaking every year on the X Games circuit or the World Cup circuit or whatever it happens to be. And that has lengthened careers. That's decreased the amounts of mental illness in sports. That has certainly reduced the number of injuries. And so it's a different approach to training. And that is what I want people to try to do in the business world now as well. And that revolves for me first and foremost around making sure that people are sleeping well. That was probably the most popular topic in the ripple effect. So we dive into it deeper uh, in, the new, in the new book. And if we are sleeping well, that sets us up to do everything else better. The brain washes itself out. It clears out amyloid plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. It gets rid of waste products. It, the glial lymphatic system activates, which is this incredible new system that we're discovering so many things about. Uh, and that in and of itself, the cleaning of the brain, the recovering and regeneration of the brain then enables the brain to do what it does best during the day, creativity, problem solving, agile thinking, learning. And so if we're able to recover deliberately, beginning of course with making sure that we're sleeping well, then everything else in our life gets better and we can actually reach our potential in whatever it is that we care about the most. It's fascinating to think that it all starts with slowing things down and rehabilitating the body but you know you then go on and talk about rehabilitating and training the mind and uh, i would have to say that kind of sleep and meditation from our work together has has had the biggest impact on my ability to, to perform maybe required because like all of us i'm aging uh but being obsessed with with performance not just the performance of organizations my own performance it's had an immense impact so talk about uh the whole area of what you call thinking about how you think 
Yeah, that's wild. This is one of the things that I discovered uh, in trying to write the book. And I always believe in having a scientific foundation for anything that I'm talking about. And the scientific foundation for this book revolves around the states of being for the brain that create brain waves, which can be measured on EEGs. So if you put electrodes on the head, you can measure brain waves. Uh, and there are different brain waves associated with different states of being. So when you're sleeping, you create delta brain waves, which are very, very slow, big waves, sort of like huge waves that you might have out in the middle of the ocean that are so big, you might not even notice that you're, you're, you're in a wave. And then you go a little bit smaller. Um, the waves get a little bit smaller, tiny bit faster. Those are theta waves when we're creative, a little bit smaller, a little bit faster. Those are alpha waves when we're able to learn and do strategic thinking, a little bit smaller, a little bit faster. Those are those are beta waves when we're hustling and performing and executing. Uh, and then even smaller and faster than that, and the entire brain gets activated at the same time, or gamma waves when we're at those transcendent moments of high performance that actually uh, put our lives onto different trajectories. The, the Steve Jobs iPhone presentation is probably the, a good example of, of that, the zone moments, the flow moments. So if we go right back to the beginning of that, theta waves and alpha waves are when we're creative and when we're strategic thinking. And so that's a state where we are reflective. That's a state when we are contemplative. That's a state when we are daydreaming. That's a state when we're ideating. And you have to slow down in order for that to happen. You can't be in hustle mode. You can't be in perform mode. You can't be checking email and get a new idea at the same time. That's why so many great ideas, the eureka moments pop into our brain when we're in the shower, for example, the water's hitting your forehead, your, eye, your eyes are closed, and you're just sort of not really thinking about doing anything, then all of a sudden, boom, a new idea pops into your brain, or you're out for a walk. And as you're walking, and you're in this rhythmic, repetitive movement pattern, your brain starts to ideate and create new ideas. Or you're on vacation, staring out at the ocean, and as the waves are crashing on the beach, your mind starts to wander, and you start to make links between new areas, or new thoughts, or new uh, put new things together or two things together that you may not have ever considered before to create a new solution to an old problem. So by slowing down, we are able to speed up, which is very counterintuitive in this era of constant unrelenting distraction and go, 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 go and hustle and execute mode. And I, I think that by slowing down, we can get better ideas. We can be a lot more strategic. We can uh, chart new courses forwards and come up with new solutions to old problems and think in an agile manner, which is the currency of the future, I believe. It's so interesting you said that, Greg, because as you, I've heard you say this before and I've read about it in terms of the work that you've done and I've practiced it to an extent, but on this week and this past weekend, um, I was driving and I was listening to a song that I've come across recently by a guy named Jose James that I really like and I somehow on uh, Apple Music had it on repeat, yep. which was fine for the first couple of times um, before, you know, I kind of got tired of the song. But then I kind of, I got lost a little bit and I started to think of some things and some amazing thoughts came into my mind, which were continuing and I was developing some kind of creative thinking, as you called it, when my wife, who's in the passenger seat said, where are you? Yes. <laughs> you recognize, can yeah. you recognize I was in a different place? Yeah. Although I was thinking creatively, I didn't even notice she was talking to me. Right. Of course, that never happens. But, yeah. you know, it was it always was paying really attention. And I think it was because of that repetitive state. So I, I'm assuming music can get you into that state as well. Yeah, absolutely. We're discovering so much about music right now, the power of music. By the way, driving is another way to get you, long distance driving is another way that typically sparks theta brainwave activity when you're driving a long distance on the highway and you're somewhat unconscious, which you shouldn't be, but it happens and you're ideating, you're daydreaming, that is no question a theta brainwave state that a lot of people can associate. The other thing you mentioned is putting a song on repeat. If you put the same song on repeat and it's something that you've heard before, you're familiar enough with it that you recognize it, but you're not thinking about it, that will also drop you into alpha and theta wave brain states. So I actually believe that we can use music to amplify our life. People can check out, um, I think it's the Ultimate Music Project, uh, which is led by Terry Stewart, who's the Chief Innovation Officer at Deloitte. Um, and so that's an entire uh, initiative and a movement that's using music to help with mental health challenges. And they're running concerts around North America to raise money for local uh, mental health um, 
challenges like CAMH or, or other institutions to deal with mental health. But we can use music in our everyday lives. You can have uh, music that psychs you up, makes you excited and happy and fired up. That's a great thing to listen to on the way to work. Uh, if you're getting ready for a meeting, having music in the background to get you into the right mindset is very important. It's why athletes always wear, not always, but many athletes wear headphones right before they compete because they've got a playlist set up to fire them up so that they know exactly the, the emotional state they want to be in when they race. Similarly, on the way home from work, you may not want to be listening to ACDC. You may want to be listening to a Jack Johnson to calm yourself down so that when you walk into the house, you are actually in a state where you can engage with your family uh, or, or friends or just be, be alone in some cases. Uh, but that ability to do rhythm. Uh, and also, actually, when I wrote this book, I would put on a concert and I, I just um, used a, a concert, Staying Live in Berlin. And so it was Staying from the Police playing uh, music with the, Ber with the London Symphony Orchestra in Berlin. Berlin. It was 90 minutes long. And I knew that that meant that I had a 90 minute block of time when I was going to sit down with no distractions, headphones on, total absorption in the work. I'd listen to it every single day for, I believe it was almost 90 or 100 days in a row. So I wasn't thinking about it, it was just in the background and I drop into this deep state of uh, concentration and creativity in order to be able to work my way through creating that book. So there's no question we can use uh, music to amplify our lives and I'd love people to be deliberate about that and use all the incredible tools that are available to us now to get access to so much amazing music and uh, you know, pretty much every day, anywhere, any, any, at any time you can have access to any album ever created. So it's, it's never been better for, for music lovers than it is right now. Thank you for that. And I want to come back to that term deliberate, because whether it's you know, when you look at data, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, this can be a foreign language, right? Yeah. For people, I know the first time I heard it, I heard it from you in terms of referencing this, but how, how do you take knowing what, you know, the knowledge of, of understanding what these states are and organize your time, plan your day around how you optimize either putting yourself in or your natural uh, cadence, let's call it, to, to, to get into those states. How do, you, how do you go about that? How does one take that and start? Um, the way to organize this around your day is as follows. Uh, I think that we need to take radical control of our days. And by that, I mean radical being complete and thorough. So often we are on other people's agendas and we do busy work instead of important work. And I want us to, as leaders, make sure that we are doing what is important and what we want to be doing so that we can get done what needs to get done. Not to say that you shouldn't take phone calls or check your email or anything like that, but I believe we need to block things. And the way to get started is to think about when are you at your best? So naturally, on any given day, when do you feel fantastic? When can you focus deeply? When do you have that easy ability to concentrate? For me, that is six in six until 10 a.m. That's my sweet spot for me functioning at the highest possible level. And so I'll get up at five, do what I need to do. And then actually I'll start work at six and blast through until about 10, 10 30, take a massive break, do email, do administration stuff, um, paperwork, whatever, maybe even go for a second workout uh, and then do another block of work in the afternoon. But I won't do create creativity in the afternoon because I'm just too tired. Like it doesn't work. So that's when I will do phone calls, meetings, uh, all of that sort of, you know, biz dev stuff in the, in the afternoon. But the morning for me is reserved for two 90 minute blocks of creativity, writing, podcasting, uh, strategic thinking, all of that work gets organized around when I'm at my best. Cause that's the most important thing to me. And then the secondary work, the more hustle focus, uh, you know, inviting people on the podcast or, um, you know, writing up proposals to send out for new clients, that stuff all gets pushed into a different time of the day when I'm better able to execute. And so for me, the mornings are theta and alpha, which is creativity and strategic thinking. And my afternoons are based around delta wave work, which is focused execution. Uh, and then when I have a key performance moment, that's what we call gamma states. Uh, when you want to be in the zone, when you want to be in that peak experience state, uh, then actually the entire day is built around that. So if I have a speech, then I'm working out, I'm meditating, I'm maybe even taking a nap, I'm you know, getting a ride in an Uber to whatever event I'm going to, so that I am peaking at that moment when I need to be delivering what I do at the highest level, which for me at the moment is speak is public speaking. Uh, also can be a podcast. I mean, you know, I took a 20 minute nap earlier today just to make sure that I was like totally ready for this event. So I'm on fire for you. 
timing of caffeine plays into all of that as well. So the idea of organizing your day and structuring your day in such a way that you are doing what you do best at the time when your circadian rhythms enable you to do that most easily is a really important idea. And it takes a long time to figure that out. But the rewards when you actually start making it happen are so exponential that uh, I think that it alters not just your ability to perform at the highest level, but also your health as well. You feel better, more energetic, you accomplish more in less time. Uh, it's much less of a struggle, but it's exquisitely high performance. So this isn't a, a, where we're, we're not punting it. We're not doing less. We're not saying I'm not up for that. It's just like you're just doing what you do best at the best time of day for you. And that's really what it all revolves around. Yeah, and it's really about... Um as you said, radical control and radical attention, mm -hmm. you can optimize you know, the states that you want based around your own, I would say, physiology and, and some best scientific practices, right? 100%. I love that word, radical attention. Uh, I love the word radical because it means complete and thorough. And attention is the, the more scientifically valid term for focus, which is huge in our world these days in an era of constant unrelenting distraction, this era of distraction that we're, we're in. And I really would love for people to, when you are trying to do your best at whatever it is that you're doing, when you're trying to perform, when you're trying to focus, when you're trying to get something done, when you're trying to be creative, defend your attention. Radical control of your attention is so huge. Eliminate the distractions, turn off the email, audio alerts, uh, turn your phone over or better put it away. Uh, you don't need multiple screens open. You only need to have available to you what you need to get done. Maybe set an alarm for X number of minutes so that you're not worried about you know, spending your entire day doing something. If 90 minutes from now you want to be checking your email, that's fine. Set an alert. That way you're not constantly checking. But the ability to get into deep focus right now, the ability to get into radical attention is so important and really is a game changer in terms of us getting done what we need to get done. So right after this, for example, I've, I'm training for an Ironman. Um, I've got a, about a two hour block before my next meeting. I'm gonna head down to the gym, gonna jump on the treadmill, I'm gonna do a very specific speed workout, but I am not gonna be connected to, to the internet during that time. That's my 45 minutes where I'm gonna to be totally focused on running. I'll come back out, sauna, very, very, very cold shower. And then I'm gonna be sitting down into a, a critical meeting right after that. But it's deep focus on what I'm doing to set myself up for the next thing. And then I will check what I need to check later on, not throughout the run, as I see so many people doing in the gym. Uh, just, you just need to get deep in on what you're doing, eliminate those distractions, and that's a total game changer for people when they actually are able to do that. And I might add something to that, and that is, as executives and, and so much of the audience that we're speaking to today, there are all sorts of reasons for distractions, and people mm -hmm. want your time. So you need, uh, I would argue, to uh, train and develop in a radical way, your support network, um, you know, whether it's your, your team members, your, um, your, you know, your administrative uh, help to ensure you get those blocks. And once you train people, just as you need to train yourself, for the most part, they respect it. Obviously, there's, uh, you know, there are always occasions, especially uh, where, you, where you need to move off it for one situation or not. But for the most part, they will respect it. And I think it, it allows for incredible focus, incredible outcomes. And, um, and I think, and, and I don't mean to make this sound uh, in any way, um, like it's bigger than it is, but I think other people will see more impact from you. And as a result, they'll want to do the same. I, I've, I've already witnessed that in my own organization, let alone in others that we, that we work with. 100%. I agree with you completely. And you're the expert in building high performance cultures. So this is a, a this is an approach that you as a leader are implementing and talking to your team about. And so once people understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and that you want other people to feel free to do the same, then all of a sudden it begins to percolate its way through the entire organization. But it's because you are doing it yourself that it's able to move out through the organization. If you were to say, I would love for you guys to do this, but then at the same time, you're not doing it yourself, it will never work. Right. That's sort of like the CEO that says, I really want you guys to go to the gym, but is always in the office before and after everyone else. Like no one's leaving the office to go to the gym when you're sitting in your, in your office getting stuff done. But if people see you go to the gym at lunch, they're going to know, okay, it's okay for me to go take care of myself. I will do it too. So it's, it's very important for there to be 
radical authenticity in all of this as well for the leadership and for the organization in order to build that high performance culture. So yeah, you're absolutely on, on the right road with that, with, with uh, what you're doing and with what your team is doing as well. Well, it is a do what I, you know, it's not a do what I say, do what I do environment. We know from all yeah. of our research, from the work we do in our Waterstone Engage uh, business today, which is culture and engagement measurement and consulting work, that leaders drive culture through their behavior and culture drives performance. So by yeah. that, it's leaders who set the behavior that drive the outcomes that lead to the performance. So 100%. Now, you're training for an Ironman. Incredible. I know you've been in, done these before and successfully, but this is uh, maybe the worst segue I've ever done from <laughs> training and focus for an Ironman, Ironman to what you talk about, you need to do less to achieve more. Now, uh, that's a bit of a curve I'm throwing you here, but talk yeah. about doing less to achieve more and really what that, what that means. Yeah, so I think that what the whole idea behind doing less to achieve more revolves around creating the environment where you can be creative. So it's create to be creative. And when we are hustling, when we are busy, when we are in execution mode, you're in, you create beta brainwaves. It's a very important mode to be in. I think that you need to get stuff done. You need to answer emails. You need to create documents. You need to review proposals. You need to do the phone calls. You need to do the meetings. That's really important. And not to minimize any of that, we need to have focused time to get that stuff done. However, the higher you go within an organization, the higher you go with in your career, the higher of a level of leadership and impact that you achieve, the less important and the less impactful the hustle and execute work becomes and the more impactful opportunities will come from strategic thinking, from agile thinking, from learning and from problem solving. And when you are able to decrease the amount that you are doing and slow down your brain waves, calm your body down, take a moment to ideate, then you're going to have the opportunity to have a different approach to the way that you're doing things. And so the only way for us to really exponentially improve ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, and our businesses from a, an exponential growth perspective is going to be from making those changes. I was just reading about um, Snap and they've been awarded by Fast Company, the uh, most innovative company of 2020, coming out of a situation where their stock price was down, I think, 86% at one point in, in 2016, 2017. And what their leadership did was they focused on a couple things radically, you know, as their, as Facebook, I think Facebook offered to buy them for three billion, they rejected it. And then Facebook took many of their key features and dropped it into Instagram to try to decimate that, that business. Um, as that was happening, you know, that's a moment when hustle and execute and just do doing more wouldn't have served them. Uh, but what they did was they adopted a couple very specific things. They focused on one-to-one -one communication. Uh, they focused on the company being very careful to, to vet the content that was published on the platform to make sure that it was true. So the trusted web before the trusted web. And you can think about how important that is right now for social media networks. And they also um, simplified their ad platform to make it much easier for people to run ads, which then I think in one year increased their ad revenue by 61%, according to the article. Uh, and so when we do things differently, when we, when we uh, adopt a different approach, when we think in an agile manner, that is what exports exponentially moves us forward. The higher up in an organization you get, the more important that type of thinking is. That type of thinking does not happen when you're in beta brainwaves. It happens when you're in alpha and theta. And so slowing down to speed up is, is the key. Back to my Ironman thing, that is actually, for me, very important because it forces me into exercise for an hour or two a day, usually in rhythmic repetitive activity, walk, run, swim which is what sparks, I know, in my own mind, creative thinking. So when I'm out for long runs, my mind is wandering and I'm thinking of stuff. And in fact, I was for the new book, I was stuck on the intro. I didn't have an intro. I had the book written, but I couldn't figure out the intro. My, my publisher was freaking out. Um, my editor was really not happy. And he, he messaged me, he's like, Greg, you've got like literally six hours to write an intro and we're going to, to print on this thing. I didn't have it. So I, went for, and, uh, so I went for a run. And when I was out on the run, an idea popped in my mind for a story from a talk that I gave 
And that's the story that is now in the intro of the book. But it only came because I stopped, left my desk, went for a run, and out on the run, came up with an idea, came back, wrote the whole thing down in about 45 minutes, flipped it out, we were done. So that whole slow down to speed up piece is just so epically critical. And for me, it's exercise that helps me to do that. Hence the need to train for Ironman. So exercise is your pivot point. What, is, what are a few other ideas that you kind of suggest to people depending on, you know, their, what they do to help, kind of help them pivot from, you know, a, it, it could even be gamma, but probably more like theta into a, a, a lesser state, a state where they can focus radically. Yeah. So there's a bunch of different things that you can do. Uh, the first one is counterintuitively when you're at work, be at work, when you're at home, be at home. And so when you're with your family, like be with your family, put the phone away. Um, although this is on my desk, when I'm with my family, I'm getting, I'm trying to be much, much better about not actually having my phone with me. Certainly at dinner, the phones are away. So when you're with your family, be deeply with your family. When you're at work, be deeply with your work, with, with work. Another simple thing that um, I've seen over and over and over again, many world-class performers in business do is keeping some sort of a journal with them to be able to actually hard copy, write things down. And that's always with me now. And I actually think um, they're not here, but actually, yeah, they are. And I've got like a whole ton of different colored pens that I use to write in it. And, you know, you know I'm a athlete who used to make fun of artists when I was in high school. And I deeply regret that because now I'm discovering there's so much art, art artist, artistry in all of us. And so the colored pens, the writing, I've recently taken up photography as a creative outlet, which is helping me to see the world in a different way. So we developed these different capabilities. Another crazy thing when I was getting ready to go commentate the Olympics, which made a massive difference for me, was taking acting lessons. And, you know, I want nothing to do with drama or being um, on stage as a, as an actor or, or as a performer, but uh, learning how to modulate your voice, learning how to engage with a camera, learning how to memorize lines, uh, learning how to create different expressions off the same lines was so critically important. So when we broaden our perspective, when we do different things, when we keep learning, and it can be as simple as reading new books or from a different field or a different author, uh, that sparks our ability to be creative. It sparks our ability to think differently. It, it sparks our ability to contemplate, to be reflective, to be more considerate. And those are all elements which I think set you up for being a different type of leader and a higher performing leader and ultimately live a much better, much more interesting life for you, for your family, for the people that work with you uh, in all aspects. So yeah, that's where I'm at recently with all of that. And you know, who knows where it'll go, but having fun with with all of those things. It's, it's, it's been a lot, it's been a really, really cool journey discovering all of that as I wrote the book over the last couple of years. But you, you also are significantly committed to and to teaching uh, things like manifesting the power of gratitude. So I'd love you to just to talk a little bit about that and, and why you believe that that's a difference maker for people in terms of their own performance. So when we get into gamma brainwave states, these states where the entire brain is activated, where we are in a state of flow when we're in the zone, and then you can go to a higher level even than being in flow and in the zone. If you're in flow, doing something that you love, and it is having an impact, that often is what pivots us or, or sparks us, is a better word, sparks us into something called peak experience which is those moments where life is just magical. It could be a moment where you're having dinner with your partner and you just connect with that look where you know everything is happening. Or uh, it could be a moment when you're out for a run and it's just, it's easy and you can go forever. It could be a great presentation, an awesome job interview, a sales pitch or meeting. Uh, it could be just about anything, but in those flow state moments where you have impact, that is what leads to, to peak experience. And when we're in those states, that is just such a cool, uh, cool environment, such a cool place to be. And so I've been practicing and trying to figure out how to get into that state more often. And the way that we've been playing with making that happen is through controlling mind, body, and emotion. So act, think, feel. And so what physical state do you need to be in in order to be in flow? And that is for me, a fairly energized, but relaxed state. Uh, what sort of mindset do I need to be in? I need to be concentrating. I need to be doing one specific thing and have absolutely no 
distractions. And from an emotional perspective, it needs to be a state of love, compassion, and gratitude. And I've learned that over and over and over again, the only way for us to truly experience life at the highest possible level is to be in that state of love, compassion, and gratitude, whether that's with your family, uh, whether that's in business. That's why empathy is so important for, for leaders, uh, where we're hearing so much, more, so much more about emotional intelligence recently. And so when we're able to get into that state of compassion and gratitude, that is what, what, un, what unlocks human potential. Uh, you can't be negative when you're in a state of compassion and gratitude. You can't be angry when you're in a state of compassion and gratitude. Uh, and so I think it's just a, it's, a, it's a state that we don't often associate with high performance in business. But the more I learn, the more I realize that the true transcendent moments, the moments of elite performance in music, drama, sports, business are founded in that state focused uh, sorry, the mind, body, emotional state that, that leads us into uh, love, compassion, gratitude, peak experience, flow, the zone, and, uh, and reaching our potential in the moment at whatever it is that you, that you care the most about. Well, I'll, I'll just end on that comment by saying how grateful I am to have learned that skill from you, and I'm still on a journey, because gratitude is something that I think has made a big impact in my life, if, if not only above all being grateful for what, uh, but for my life and what I have, um, but, but still along that journey of being grateful for others and the little things they do and the impact they have on me. I'm very grateful for you. What do you see, Greg, just to move off a little bit, uh, uh, what we were talking about, you know, we're, we're really talking about being a high performance person and or leader in order to help build high performance cultures, that it starts with you, that as we talked about, you know, uh, behavior drives uh, outcomes and it's these outcomes that drives culture and, cu and culture drives performance. So what do you see as trends? What do you see coming on the horizon in terms of uh, high performance leaders, you know, superhuman leadership as we call it? What do you think is going to be important as we look forward? Um, I think the first one as a general broad trend is the interest in neurophysiology, the science of the brain. Uh, huge leaps were made when we discovered functional magnetic resonance imaging, when we could image the brain and discover what parts of the brain were active when we were doing different tasks. But we're also learning so much more now using other technologies like diffusion tensor imaging about what networks exist in the brain and, and how the brain works. So our understanding of neurophysiology is exploding. That's one of the main reasons why I wrote that book because I wanted to learn about it. And so the, writing the book forced me to learn and get up to speed on neurophysiology. I think that will only continue. The brain is one of the uh, sort of the last frontiers inside the human body that we don't understand very well. And so as we develop that understanding, the implications for all of us are going to be incredible. Uh, I think personalized medicine is definitely something to pay attention to. Uh, medicine that's customized for your own genetics. We're not there yet, but we're uh, definitely looking at that as something that's going to be very important for people in the next three to five years. If you think about it, the, the human genome when, when first sequenced was hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, right now to get your genome sequenced is about $2,500. Within a couple of years, it will be about $25. So uh, that technology is coming at us very, very quickly. On a more sort of uh, fundamental level, I've, I see mindfulness and meditation being a huge trend that's being adopted by many leaders and with tremendous results, both from a mental health perspective, but a mental performance perspective. Uh, so that would be something to add if you're not already doing that. Explore headspace.com or calm.com to get started. Muse headbands are also a great way to do that. Uh, and then the final piece, which is maybe something people can take out and, and a trend that I'm seeing is the number of people that are stopping drinking. I cannot tell you the number of people that, are, that I've encountered over the last few years that are not just decreasing the amount that they're drinking, but actually stopping it all together. Uh, so that's another sort of um, broad trend in terms of uh, improving your performance on a daily basis and against the background of a culture that uh, definitely, you know, has, has businesses, drinking has been part of business. When you go out for dinner or you go out for drinks and, you know, it's been, it's been a part of what you do, but that culture I see is shifting radically these days because people become very concerned about health and well-being and high performance and making sure that they're just as good yesterday as they were, just as good tomorrow as they were yesterday, so... Greg, last question. And that is, you know, you're listening today, 
you know, you're a CEO, you're an executive, and you want to start on this journey to uh, prepare yourself personally in kind of the, the path towards building a high performance organization, a high performance culture. Now, what's the one piece of advice that you'd give someone who said, look, I, I want to start, I just don't know what, how, or I don't know where to start. In terms of starting that kind of high performance journey, what would you say to them? Okay, you're a CEO, you're a leader, you want your culture to improve, you want your culture to shift towards high performance. There's one very simple thing that if you do this, it will radically alter your culture. If you fix the food that is available in your business, it will completely change your organization. If you get rid of the sugary snacks, if you get rid of the pop, if you get rid of the junk food carts that go around, and replace them with healthy options that are easy to get access to. Uh, it will completely change the way people function at work. They will feel better. They will have more energy. They will be happier. They will be healthier. They will arrive at the weekend with uh, you know, the possibility of actually spending some time doing the things that maybe aren't related to work, but that they still love. Uh, it's just the most important thing. So think about what is available for people to eat at your office and start to consistent, slowly and consistently make some changes to make better options available. And that goes to what, what do you serve at meetings? What do you serve in boardrooms? What snacks are available for people? Uh, what type of food are you ordering when you go out for lunch? Or, or are you ordering into the office to have for lunch? It all makes a difference. And if you want a fast hack to improving the culture of your company, fix the food. Fast hacking by fixing the food at the office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great way to start. Greg, on that note, you know, and I'm practicing gratitude again, I want to thank you for being our inaugural guest on yeah. uh, building high performance cultures. Uh, it does start with, with individual. I know you're not, this isn't the last time you're going to be on the show, whether I have to come and, and uh, you know, twist your arm another time. But uh, I want to tell you that, the things you do make a inordinate difference in uh, people's lives. It certainly has in my life. Uh, and uh, I know that some of the things I've learned, many of the things I've learned, we take into organizations and leaders as well. And you and I are going to continue our work. We'll talk about this on a little trailer in terms of the Waterstone Wells uh, High Performance Institute uh, and some work we're going to be doing. If you're interested in that, listen uh, to the end of the, the blog or the podcast. Uh, and by yourself, by the way, do yourself a favor and get yourself a copy of Rest, Refocus, and Recharge. And if people want to do that, where do they go to Amazon? Where else? Um, Amazon or any bookstore. It's um, available hard copy in bookstores and all the all the outlets in um, online for in Canada and the states. So yeah, check it out. And uh, you can just go to my website as well, drgregwells.com, and it's on the home page. And you can just click the links there. Dr. Greg Wells, my friend, thank you very much. And uh, here's to a high performance afternoon. Right on, Marty. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm super grateful as well for um, your friendship and for all the things we've been able to do together and also for the future. We're going to have a blast. We sure are.